stone so hard, he can't be split, and it's the man who acts unbreakable, a hit. Welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guests today, for the second of a two-part chat, are composer Ricky Ian Gordon and librettist Michael Corey, whose new opera, The Grapes of Wrath, we just saw a montage from. Uh, it just opened to an excellent reception in Minneapolis and is about to open in uh, Utah and uh, Pittsburgh and the Houston Grand Opera. Uh, uh, what this opera, what I've seen of it, has beautiful scenes one after another. What constitutes, in your mind, a good scene in an opera? Wow, Michael, you answer that. <laughs> well, I think that uh, it's it's the same as in a play. There's an obstacle that has to be overcome and, and a climax. And in an opera, those dramatic needs have to be expressed through the music. And uh, you have to reach into the soul of the character and find what they're saying. And it has to advance the story to the next scene. Uh, a dumb question, uh, for which I know the answer, but uh, which comes first, the music or the words? The words come first in most cases in this opera. There are some, in, in, by the way, in terms of what you just asked, I would also say too that for me, I have, to, I have to know what the logic of a scene is and then I have to create the musical logic so that it's musically satisfying the scene, at least to right. my tastes. But there are, there are some interesting examples in this opera. There was, I wrote a prelude to act three um, and when Michael heard it, he said, that's I'll be there the big duet for Majode and Tom in Act 3. And so he took the, a recording of the Prelude to Act 3 home and created I'll Be There, which now is not the Prelude to Act 3, it's just I'll Be There. <laughs> I think the difference between opera and musicals is, well, one of the big differences is the way they're made. Uh, we're, we should just start at the beginning and where I to hand Ricky three pages, he would have to decide how these characters sound like from three pages. But if I give him an entire act at a time, he can pick a moment somewhere in the middle, figure out in this moment of conflict how a character sounds, what his or her music is, work backwards and forward. So it gives him more options. I call that, for me, it's like I have to enter at the hot spots. Right. Do you know what I mean? And then once I've set enough of the hot spots to music for myself, I feel like I have the thematic material, and that's how I start building the whole. And then you can go back to quieter, easier things. Uh, yes. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, what, I in your mind, is uh, your, you two are writing uh, in an American tradition of, of musical theater. How does this differ from, or if at all, from European, the European musical theater? Mm. For one thing, it seems, at least, I mean, I would say 
in, in, in it, the strength of the narrative and the um, stress on the narrative. At least nowadays, it seems like European musical theater nowadays is um, more abstract, collagistic. Um, this is very American in terms of the way the story is told. Would you agree? Or are you talking about classic uh, European music? Yes, I am. Oh. Well, I guess um, opera started the ball rolling. Right. That uh, became operetta, uh, mm -hmm. which in France and in England, which ultimately influenced um, the uh, people creating musicals over here, and that grew from immigrant music and American roots music, African American music, and it all combined and uh, with popular theater and kind of put made opera look like a museum. But things are cyclical, um, and I think actually because of the, the rock revolution in music, that schism that occurred between popular music and classical music, people became used to listening to continuous music through popular rock music, albums, all of that, and now young people are interested in opera again because it's continuous music, and I think less interested in talk sing, talk sing musicals. Right. It's funny because you look at even what's happening now in terms of Sondheim's pieces being done in opera houses, I love even that with your Ghost of Versailles that Kristen Chenoweth is going to be in it at the Met. That speaks volumes, that the combination of disciplines there. We're crossing over both yeah. ways. Yeah. We are, and we have performers that can do that, and we're not wed anymore to hidebound rules. I saw Audrey McDonald this year do um, La Voix Humaine, the Poulenc, at the Houston Grand Opera, and then she did a Michael John, like a, a one-act opera. Michael John Lacuse appeared. Yeah. And it seems like all the boundaries are being crossed these days in a good way. It's healthy, I think. How are you guys handling recitatives, uh, which we, is always a big problem? Our recitative is very stylized. It's really lyrics and music. Except that we did. We went through a, a thing where we did a reading of Act One in Minnesota, and we realized we had dialogue in the piece, Bill. Right. And we realized that it wasn't strong enough that when the singers stopped singing, not that they were bad actors, but that a kind of pitch and volume dropped. Right. And that as soon as we set it to music, they acted at the same pitch as when they were singing, and it made more sense. It's because I've thought of that in terms of our work, is, is the, that the idea that dialogue set to music for right. opera singers. Right. Uh, we use a lot of dialogue, yeah. plain old dialogue. In morning store. Right. Uh, I um, now, I thought we it would be great to hear some of your other work, and uh, 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 you guys come with a lot of history, and uh, which is delightful. I I would love to hear. Um, we're going to start with you, Michael. We're going to hear sure. uh, a montage from uh, Grey Gardens. Uh, uh, can we roll that? You fight City Hall with a Persian shawl that used to hang on the bedroom wall, pinned under the chin, adorned with a pin, and pulled into a twist. Reinvent the OJ Trouvé, make a poncho from a duvet, then you can be with Cousin Lee on Mr. Blackwell's list. The full-length velvet glove hides the fist. We're an act like Crosby and Hope, a rosy complexion and ivory soap. Pip and Miss Estella, Hedda and Noella, two peas in a pot. The days are gone when money grew on trees. The money tree came down with elm disease. But if I age ducks for my two bucks, I'll eat the cake I have and like it. I'll eat the cake I have. One little leaf adrift in the breeze Refuses to fall from the sky Blown by the wind, it clings to the trees Unwilling to wither and die The summer's over, but I'm still a girl Blah. 
blossom to blossom my buzz like a bee then glance in the mirror and who do I see a middle-aged woman in her me because it's winter in a summer town Grey gardens will be decked out in its pride Right as a liberty die Lady will be here with Joe in time Like a Norman Rockwell family Our photo in the Hamptons Be The event of 1941 <laughs> I've overspent a bit. The man who's gonna pay for it is it's arriving on the five. Fifteen. That's so delightful, Michael. Uh, you wrote the lyrics for that show. I did. I wrote the lyrics to Grey Gardens while I was writing the libretto to Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> Perfect and combination. When one would frustrate me, I'd go to the other. Uh, who were those wonderful performers in Grey well, Gardens? Well, we saw Christine Eversall playing um, Little Edie uh, and playing Little Edie's mother in Act One, uh, and Mary Louise Wilson playing Edith. Uh, Bouvier Beale in Act Two, and we saw the young Little Edie played by Aaron Davey, and there are just three facets of, of this woman, of this amazing family, uh, the, the uh, Beals. Edith was, Edith Bouvier Beale was Jacqueline Kennedy's aunt, and Little Edie, her daughter, was her first cousin. And these were uh, derelict women living in they, Long In the Island. first act, it's 1941, they're at the top of their game, they're American aristocracy. And in act two, everything has gone to hell. The house has, <laughs> has declined, they have no money left, they're living with 52 cats in rubble of, of mm -hmm. what their life used to be. And so really, Grey Gardens, as uh, Doug Wright, the playwright, has written mm -hmm. the book, and Scott Frankel, the composer, has written the score, is a story of America. Right. Uh, and the decline of America and its aristocracy, but all of us, and the story of aging, um, as, ex as seen through these two Edies. Well, it, uh, it is, uh, it's a big hit, and uh, it, looks, uh, it looks fabulous. You know, it's, it's wonderful to write for such colorful characters, and the fact that they really existed, that it's a musical based on a documentary, was a fascinating challenge. Right. Uh, uh, Ricky, I, I wanted to play a selection from uh, uh, your piece, Orpheus. Wh what do you call Orpheus? What is the, what is the genre? Well, Orpheus and Eurydice, it's a, I call it a two-act song cycle. Um, but in a way, it's really like an opera for soprano, clarinet, and piano. And when we did it at Lincoln Center um, with Doug Verone and a, a dance company, it's it's really a piece of music drama, but just on my terms. Do you know what I mean? It's um, it tells the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. It was a way, on some level, of my telling about when my lover Jeffrey um, became very sick with AIDS and died. It was the first time in my life when the the archetype of mythology became necessary for me. Telling that story became necessary for me on some level in terms of talking about what was happening to me. Uh, let's play it. I was 
Of course, that was you playing the piano and Elizabeth Futrell playing uh, a singing. Who was the, the flute? Todd Palmer. Todd Very Palmer, beautiful. the clarinetist who commissioned the piece originally. Beautiful. Uh, Poor Todd wanted a little 10 minute piece <laughs> for the soprano clarinet, and piano and I gave him a 70 minute monodrama. <laughs> uh, what um, opera seems to be. Uh, reaching more and more people. Uh, Peter Gelb at the Met mm -hmm. is, seems to be a genius at reaching people. He has uh, the Met playing in movie theaters, uh, in high def, in, and in they all sell out. and they're selling out. Mm -hmm. People like new work. Uh, people. Your big opera is coming back. The mm -hmm. Ghosts of Versailles by John Coriano and myself is coming back to the Met. Uh, Shameless plug, Bill. Oh, it's a great opera. That's great. Thank you. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, what, um, how can we reach even more people? Why aren't we... Male frontal nudity. Male frontal nudity. <laughs> that's a, that's you know, a big I, seller. I think it's, it's, a, the, it's a money issue. The opera is so expensive. Um, and, uh, so we need a Great Depression. A, well, no, uh, seats need to be cheaper, or we need to find ways of bringing it out into the streets. And Peter Gelb's new, new way of bringing it into movie theaters is one way, and it's a great way. But we need to see live. We need right. to see people live, and we need to have more support of the arts, frankly, so that young people can be brought into these theaters, experience it, and make it a part of their lives, because the young people really like it. But maybe, too, outreach. I wonder, you know, when we did Grapes in Minnesota, they, the press people were amazing, and Michael and I were all over that community, and every performance sold out. It was like helps. a rock concert. But you know, there's no dress rehearsals, there's no previews, but on, the, on, our, on our final tech, they brought in an audience of uh, 1,000 high school kids, and we had no idea they were coming, and I was scared. I said, oh my God, they're going to talk through the whole opera, they're going to be bored, they're going to go in the lobby. They loved it. They stayed till midnight to talk about it with us afterwards. They I'm got it. So they got like autographs from Michael and I. I'm just so impressed, and I really yeah. think that people's brains have changed. These were ordinary, oper ordinary, ordinary, ordinary high kids, people. and they, they listened mm -hmm. to the music, and they got all the words. And you know, you used to hear all the time, I can't understand opera singers. They got every word. What, well, some and things surtitles do help. They help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That seems to have changed the, the nature of the beast. The, the I movie. think so. Even for me, I mean, I went to the opera my whole childhood, and you know, I if you are going to sit through some of the longer operas or an opera you've never seen before, those surtitles really help, unless you do all your homework and study the piece you know, in advance of the performance. It really does help, I think. I just think all the ingredients are there for opera. It's spectacle. You've got a big orchestra. You've got great singers. What opera, the world of opera doesn't have anymore is great big stars, like they used to have in the days of Callas and Tobaldi. Uh -huh. um, but, and, and, and people went to operas with different expectations to hear the performance. Now when we do new operas, they're going to see the story Let and hear the music. Yeah. Let the writers be stars. Right. Uh, <laughs> what uh, old operas have influenced you? Well, I love 
love many of the operas. The ones I loved best were actually the ones that are not the most highly regarded. I liked Offenbach. I loved the Tales of Hoffman. It Me was too. a great story. Me too. Oh, that's a great Full album, of magic yeah. and phantasmagoria, mm -hmm. as we right. call it. I love Lulu and Wozzeck and I, I love... Wozzeck is the best. Yeah, I think I like Lulu better. I love Lulu and Wozzeck. I love Mahagoni. I love um, every single, I mean, Britain, Peter Grimes, right. Billy Budd, Turn of the Screw, Death in Venice, my favorite of all of them. And yeah, and you have to love parts of Wagner. Mm -hmm. Verdi, Puccini, it's just this sweeping music that you can't resist. Every Puccini. Gershwin. Yeah, yeah good Phil Porky Glass, Best. John Adams, they're all fantastic. Yeah. Mozart. I love Satyagraha. That made a oh. big impression on me when I first saw that. Mm -hmm. Ghost of Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my main influence. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, talk about grand uh, operas. Uh, uh, let's hear uh, Harvey Milk that you, uh, that Michael wrote with Stuart Wallace. Yeah. Uh, let's roll that. singing in that opera? That was Bob Orth, the wonderful Bob mm -hmm. Orth, who also played Uncle John in The Grapes of Wrath, and we wrote the part for him. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, who was playing that beautiful, uh, uh, oh, that's some uh, fabulous orchestra? Was that it? was the San Francisco Symphony, uh -huh. uh, conducted by Donald Ronicles and the San Francisco Opera and Chorus. Now, Harvey Milk, the opera of Harvey Milk, was the life of, based on the life of Harvey Milk, and the uh, the gay activist uh, who was murdered. Yes, by Dan White. He was uh, a, a, a city councilman, a, a city supervisor, Harvey Milk. He was the first openly gay uh, elected city official uh, in San Francisco. And Dan White was from a conservative uh, district also. They didn't get along. Something happened. And Dan White shot Harvey Milk and the mayor of San Francisco. This project started life actually at the Houston Grand Opera, and this recording um, that you heard was made at San Francisco when we had worked out all the kinks and brought it home to right. San Francisco. And what an experience that was. It was, of course, life intersecting with art. And I remember we did one of the performances on an anniversary of Milk's uh, assassination, and there was a candlelit march from the gay district, the Castro, to the Opera House. We put people from the real community into the opera. It sounds like uh, uh, the days of Verdi when he was doing uh, Italian nationalistic works and uh, with torchlight parades celebrating his uh, uh, arrival and uh, uh, the history of opera. You've rejoined the history of opera when it was a popular mm -hmm. art form. Um, what stands in the way of uh, opera? What, what conventions of opera stand in the way of making it a popular art form again? 
Do you think it's possible? Some even? of our opera houses are standing in the way, and things I'm, I'm glad to say are changing. But so often they were influenced by the European m way of doing things and a sort of dismissal of American music and American history and a feeling that we couldn't do it as well. I think it's why, you know, someone like John Adams, too, you know, it's built into the contracts of, of his pieces that they have to be, they're mic'd. His pieces are mic'd, and the orchestra, there's all this electronics in it. I think even in terms of the work he's doing, he's trying to say, this is when people come into theaters now, they expect to really hear, you know? And it was, it was a, a big adjustment for us when we went into the theater from the rehearsal room, and Grape sounded so quiet at first on the stage, you know what I mean? And then we grew to we grew used to it, but I think opera has to accept where we well, are. Historically. There are those technical considerations. I mean, yeah. there may be two. How many opera companies? There's a wonderful op organization called Opera America, to which all the American and Canadian opera companies belong, and there's probably about two or three hundred of them. But how many of them are doing new work? Maybe ten at the maximum, right. twenty. And so many of them say our audiences don't accept new work. Our audiences won't come, they leave in the middle. But that's now been disproven. New work sells out consistently, uh, and people Look want to see... Look at the Met Tan yep, Dunn. Yeah. Dun. Every yeah. performance sold out. The Ghost of Versailles will sell out. Harvey yeah. Milk sold out every performance it was ever played at. Uh, and The Grapes of Wrath was a huge financial success as well as artistic. So money will triumph, thank God. And well... It's an equalizer. Well, I'm, uh, on that note, I, I think we have to end. I'm sad to say that we have to stop here, but uh, that's what they're telling me. It's been a great pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you, Ricky Ian Gordon and yeah. Michael Corey and our home and studio audiences for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon for further conversations. Thank, Thank you. Guys.